Okay, my wonderful students, let's begin lecture. And uh, good. Uh, oh boy, hold on a second. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about angular momentum today, item two. And let me just give you a, a little bit of a, uh, oh, hold on a second. So as I was just saying, we're going to study angular momentum today. And I want you to make a, a preliminary note. Okay, you guys ready in the back there? Ready? Okay. When we study angular momentum, we're adding the third of the three main dynamical quantities that are conserved in nature. And I'm going to give you some examples of conservation of angular momentum uh, toward the end of lecture, uh, terrestrial and uh, celestial, some astronomical uh, examples and some terrestrial examples. But what we want to do is start with the concept of torque and, uh, and relate that to the concept that we already know uh, as force. Uh, but before we do that, any of that, I have a couple other things to just review with you. Uh, first of all, um, office hours, it, it's on this introductory screen every day. Uh, but I think a few of you are, are not uh, planning on that. Wednesday, 11 a.m. to noon in the Physical Sciences Building Room, uh, PS158. And that's the big solarium uh, on the first floor, right by the main entrance. And if I'm not there, I'm in my regular office, PS156, which is just two doors down. We have SI uh, today, 2.30, um, and also tomorrow, 3 o'clock. So uh, as always, try to get uh, to that. For exam two, the, the two big um, uh, formulas that we've been working on the last week the impulse formula, F delta T equals delta P, and the work formula, F delta X, the work, equals change in kinetic energy, delta KE. Uh, you expect to see both of those on exam two, right, which is coming up a week from today. And remember, if we can keep on pace uh, and do well on exam two, uh, there's a possibility that we'll be able to uh, cut lecture on Thursday. So. So study hard and, and do your homework. I'm starting to talk like your mother-in-law, but anyways. Uh, now, getting toward the concept of angular momentum. Uh, we've talked about different orbits um, caused by gravity. And we know that the orbital parameters that are important uh, are the radius. Uh, if it's a circular orbit like a geosynchronous satellite, uh, and also the mass, although the mass of the satellites cancels out, hopefully you recall that from a couple weeks ago. The other things that are important and are, are what we've done um, uh, to uh, already, and that is the energy, specifically a gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy. Uh, and also what we're going to add today is the angular momentum. And these different orbits here, you know, high eccentricity, elliptical orbit, or a perfectly circular, circular uh, low Earth orbit, LEO, or, or a, which, you know, a huge number of satellites are low Earth orbit like that. Very few are out there at the geosynchronous range. Uh, but those are circular orbits. But, we, you know, we have the high eccentricity jobs, too. We talked about those. Now, what I want to do with you is a couple eye clicker questions to to just kind of warm your brain up and start thinking about things that we need to um, savvy um, angular momentum. So here's question number one. Look at this seesaw very carefully. Matter of fact, you might want to make a, a sketch of this in your notes. And then make a vote. A, B, or C. 
Look at the dimensions, look at the masses, then make a decision. Which way is this one going to spin? Or does it does it not spin at all? Okay, uh, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All right, let's stop this. And uh, yeah, most of you got this one correct. Um, clockwise is how it'll spin. Um, the reason for that, the heavier weight is on the right side, and it's equally spaced. Now, if you've ever gone on a seesaw with somebody that's heavier than you or that's lighter than you, you know that if you change position slightly, if you can, um, you can actually balance the other person. Now, let's try another one. Uh, and this one's similar, but read it very carefully. It's not this exactly the same. Okay, fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, we'll stop this one. And uh, yeah, you guys did pretty good on this. Uh, the correct answer is it doesn't spin. And why doesn't it? It's because it's balanced. Matter of fact, these two are kind of a mock up of the standard balance where you measure the mass of an object in the scales. Um, now, what I want you to take as your lesson from this, the moral of the story here is that the distribution of matter in terms of spinning and balancing, rotational motion, the distribution of matter is important. Let me repeat that so you can put it in your notes. When it comes to spinning, any kind of rotational motion, uh, the distribution of matter is important. Okay, so is the matter close in to the pivot point? Are the, is it balanced with an identical mass or is it kind of off balance? Are they different distances? All that stuff factors in and we're gonna start building that up and, and finish building it up on Thursday. Um, now, in this particular diagram, there are two, for actually there's three forces acting. There's two weight forces on the seesaw. Okay, there's, there's a weight force over here on the left side, a weight force downward the same size. Uh, what's 20 times 9.8? 20 times 9.8. It's uh, 196. Okay, so you got 196 over here, you got 196 over here, and therefore at the, at the fulcrum here, You've got 392 upward. It's because it's balanced. It's not going anywhere and it's not spinning. Now, the thing is that this one, if it were the only one here, it would cause this thing to spin counterclockwise, right? Similarly, if this were the only one here, it would cause it to spin clockwise. So those weights out there can cause spin and that's, actually what we're going to study. What is it that causes spinning in a balanced system? And the answer is something called torque. So uh, here's the spelling of it, T-O-R-Q-U-E. And basically torque is the rotational analog of force and it really matters where you apply the force. Okay, and here's a diagram from the textbook where I have a little shrimpy kid and uh, defeating her brother on the seesaw because she's a lot further out at point X. 
Um, and you can look at that if you have the textbook. Now, the whole idea of torque and leverage um, basically is, you know, what, what matters is where your position is. In other words, where you are, in, for instance, in reference to this wrench, you know, where have you got a hold of it? Are you holding it at the end or are you holding it down close to the, you know, to the, uh, the wrench end? And how many newtons are you pushing or pulling with it, right? So if you've ever, you know, worked on your car or tried to repair a machine or something, you know, you got, you have to have the right size wrench and also it has to be big enough to put enough torque to cause the nut to break, break free. You know, sometimes you got to use WD-40 or, or some other chemical to, to break the nut, but the, you know, the amount of torque you put on a wrench like that. And I've seen guys in the laboratory with big, huge wrenches, you know, big crescent wrenches this long, right? Extremely big crescent wrenches, you know, for nuts that are about this, you know, a couple inches across, right? So they have this big crescent wrench. And then what they do is they take a steel pipe and they slide it over the end of the crescent wrench. And then they go to the end of the steel pipe and then they start uh, pushing or pulling on it. It's amazing what these guys do. Let's do an example here. For instance, um, a door and a hinge. Okay, now here's two different pictures of a door hinges at point H. Okay, so that's where it's going to spin. All right, it's going to spin about point H. If you render a force or apply a force to it properly. Now, this configuration here, if you if you provide an upward force at the end of the door, okay, you're going to get maximum torque. In other words, the uh, door will open the fastest, okay? And you can open the door with a smaller force or you can open the door with a, you know, with a force, you know, down here, you know, pointing upward, same force pointing upward. But if you're down here, you won't get as much leverage. The further out you go from the spin axis, the more leverage you have, okay? Now, the other example is down here. If your force is like F2, that's, and nobody here would do that, okay, unless you were hypnotized by your enemies, okay? You know, nobody would push on the door toward the hinge as F2 is doing here, all right? And the reason nobody here would do this is because you know you want to open the door or close it, you know, and that that's not going to do jack. Because you're you're pointing toward the axis, that'll put a squeeze on the door, but it won't make it you know open up or down. All right. So this one's zero torque, the door doesn't even open. All right. And so this is an example of what I mean by it matters where and in fact what angle you apply. Um, your newtons of force, however many newtons you, you have, okay? And the cool thing about leverage and torque is you can, you know, you can move some really big objects if you have leverage. You know, if you've, if you've ever worked out, you know, uh, in the garden and excavated trees or shrubs or something, you know, to go in and plant something else. You know, you have to use a, a landscaping bar, which is a really long, basically a really long crowbar with a, a chisel end that you can use to chop through roots and stuff. And you can use that to get some mighty leverage on those stumps and, and you know, pry them up out of the ground. And I've done that a million times. Um, and, you know, there's other ways that we, you know, here's another one. If you ever see a... Um, uh, Progress Energy, or not, not Progress, uh, Duke Energy, or any other power company truck. You know, they've got those those trucks where they have the basket at the end, and then they, you know, they unfold it. You know, they have two arms, two levers, and they and they extend them, and then they move it and spin it and stuff in different directions, you know, to get up to the power line or wherever it is. Uh, those are levers, okay? And you can't put a whole lot of weight in those babies, you know, just, uh, you know, one or two, uh, man with some equipment, but yeah, those are levers, and uh, they're pretty long. 
Now let's do another example here. Let's take a look at a, a board floating out in a pond, and this also is a diagram from the textbook. All right, so what happens when you push on different spots? You know, this previous slide, you know, we were pushing at uh, the, basically the same spot, the very end of the door. Okay, we got max torque over here, and we got zero torque over here, and that's the same uh, force, but um, different angles. Now, what if you push with the same force, F1 and F2, but one of them pushes uh, through the center of mass, which is point C. Go ahead and sketch that board. And then out, off to the right a little bit, you know, halfway or whatever you like, point A on the center line, but not in the center. Okay, what happens if you push at F2 with the same number of newtons? Well, let's take a look at what you get here. Um, uh, you're you're going to have something different than what we've seen in the past. I mean, in the past, you know, if we exert a force on a baseball or a basketball or something, it just goes. It accelerates for as long as we're, you know, putting a force on it. Okay. And so, you know, we think of baseballs as point objects that you can't really put torque on. Actually, I take that back because a pitcher throwing a curveball does put a torque you know, he throws a, uh, a curveball, he puts a spin on it. If you play tennis, you put spin on the tennis ball, if you know what you're doing. Um, and soccer, the same. You know, you put a spin on the soccer ball, it'll, it'll curve left or right, down or up, you know, or stay aloft. Um, volleyball. Uh, anybody here play volleyball? Uh, any volleyball? No one in here has ever played volleyball. Wow. <laughs> That's just, okay. Uh, I imagine that really, really, really top players in volleyball probably put spin on the volleyball to defeat their uh, opponents. But this is, you know, so a point object like a baseball, we don't have that here. Um, we have a real object like a board, and it's going to have a complex trajectory, all right, depending on the size of F equals MA, and also depending on, you know, where you you apply it, in other words, depending on torque effects. So for instance, in this case, force F1 through the center of mass point C, it'll just accelerate the board across the pond toward you know, that point B off in the distance, all right? So that's normal. You know, you're pushing right at the center of mass, and so it just kind of goes straight across. It doesn't do anything, but if you press, Oh, the same size force F2 um, at, you know, through point A, uh, then it's going to spin as well. It's going to move across the lake and it's going to spin. Now spinning, um, you know, whether it's on a, a wrench, whether it's a teeter-totter, a seesaw, or this plank out in the, or a door, um, that brings to mind the whole idea of angular momentum. So let's take a look at that now. Now we just walked through the rotational analog of F equals MA, which is torque. And so it's fair to ask that, okay, the net force changes the momentum state. We know that, all right? And so what is it that torque changes? And in this a second equation block here, I'm using lowercase tau. Greek letter tau. It looks kind of a T without a top, right? A, t a T without a top. Um, and there's other uh, symbols that people use for, for torque, but this is the one that we'll use. So torque, I mean, if it's a good analog, you know, and to the force, and force is delta P over delta T, then torque is going to be delta something over delta T. So what is it? Well, it turns out that the answer to that question is angular momentum. So that's what we're going to try to um, try to uh, uh, study now. Now I want to give you a little bit of a vocabulary term that you'll encounter in your reading. Um, so here's a little uh, uh, sidestep to some vocabulary. Uh, the three words trans or two words translational and rotational. Translational uh, motion translational momentum 
means an object is going in a straight line trajectory of some kind or is, you know, has a well-defined uh, velocity in a certain direction, at least at an instant of time. Okay, so that and it's the it's the motion that something takes when it's going from point A to point B. Okay, so that would be translational. Even if it's something like a baseball, you know, the baseball is moving uh, and translating from point A to point B, from where it gets from home plate out to the outfield. All right. Now rotational is something spinning, and it might not even move from point A to point B. You know, you might, you know, so in translational motion, if you're observing it, you're tracking it with your eyes, you got to move your coconut from one side to the other, you know, wherever it's going. But for rotational motion, you know, like if you spin a top and it, it just kind of sits there spinning, you know, the, the way tops, you know, sometimes do if it's a good flat desk, um, you don't have to move your eyes, you just, you know, eyeballing it, you know, and watch it spin. Now, it's possible to have a combination of both motions. And this is kind of a cool uh, one. So go ahead and put a, a circle around that or something, a star next to it. Um, yeah, you can have something follow um, a trajectory, a uh, constant velocity for the center of mass, but it might be spinning uh, or rotating. And so that combination motion, I have a couple good photos of it. Um, let's take a look at uh, some of those. Here's a picture of a wrench, crescent wrench, and the scientist that made this strobe photo, if you look at it carefully, you'll see that uh, this one right here, where my cursor is, uh, it's clear, it's the most clearest one, or the most clear uh, image, you can see that he painted a black plus sign uh, at that point on the wrench. Now that's to symbolize the look or to identify the uh, center of mass of this wrench, right? So he got this wrench and he tosses it with a spin. And this is an overhead view. So it's going across a smooth black surface, nearly frictionless and it's spinning. And the, the center of mass is going at, a certain number of meters per second, all right? It's, it's probably not moving very fast, but it is. Now, I put this set of uh, uh, bluish diamonds with a white outline. I put the, let me put this sound down a little bit. This is a little too hot. All right. I put the, uh, the, uh, these blue diamonds up here in exact, and they're equally spaced. Now I'm going to move them down onto those black plus signs, and they're going to exactly cover them up. Now look, watch now. Here's the animation. All right, there it is. And so they directly cover it up. Um, and what that signifies is it really, if it's a strobe photo, you're, I mean, it's a strobe photo of constant velocity if you're looking at the center of mass. So here we go again. Here's, here's the, the, the diamonds, and I'm gonna park them just for visibility purposes over the black plus signs. And you can see that they line up in a row. They're all straight line. They're equally spaced. I can tell you that because I designed the, di the diamond array. They're all equally spaced. And so the equal times of the strobe photo uh, or the equal time intervals tell you that this wrench is going at, you know, like 0 0.21 meters per second from left to right, right? But it's also spinning. So the translational speed is a constant in this diagram, all right? It's an overhead view of a tabletop with a spinning wrench. Now, you sometimes see on the internet strobe photo, you know, I, the one that is mysti most mystifying to me is somebody drops a cat from a few feet above the ground and the cat, and then they do strobe photos 
And the cat will do very unusual twists with its body so that it lands on its feet. Cats will land on their feet. They, for some reason, they just know instinctively how to do that. And I've looked at those strobe photos. I'm sure you can find them on the Internet. Just do stro strobe falling cat in Google, and you'll probably find a zillion pictures of it. And it's mysterious, but they do it, you know. And there's all kinds of strobe photos all over the Internet. Here's another one. Now, this is a guy that's not on a straight line motion. He's on a parabolic arc. He's on a baseball arc, all right? And if you look closely at this, it's a motorcyclist. You know, I, I was looking at this this morning so I could get it just right. And, oh, my goodness, look at this guy right about here. He's basically where, where my cursor is here. So let's see. This is the one, two, three, fourth strobe image here right up here. He's basically doing a handstand on his handlebars, but he's upside down. Is there anybody in here that's ever done that on a motorcycle? I, yeah, I didn't think I'd see the hands for that. And look at that guy. I, it's just incredible. I never noticed. I've, I've used this, this image uh, uh, several times, but I never noticed what he was actually doing. And then by the time, and you know, so he does this daredevil thing. But then, but so this is like a cat. I mean, a cat will do these outlandish things to twist its left, you know, its its back legs and its front legs and stuff, and land on its feet. This guy's doing the same thing. He's doing these outlandish things like this handstand. And up here, it's kind of hard to, for me to see, but uh, one of these, if if you look at, like I think this one right here, the very next one, he's like totally out of you know, you know, no normal position. But by the time he gets back down here, yeah, he's he's back in the saddle and he's ready to land. It's incredible. I don't know how those guys do it, you know, without breaking their bones, you know, in a thousand places uh, from uh, from practice runs. Here's another one. Now, this guy's not so radical, but he's taken off and extending – and his center of mass is following a baseball trajectory, you know, standard parabola. Uh, but he himself and the motorcycle are interacting. Okay, so they're, you know, they're he's pushing and pulling on the motorcycle, um, and but he eventually gets back into standard position here, and he's ready to land. But oh my goodness, like right here, I think he's got his feet. Uh, out in front of the handlebars or something. I, I don't even want to look at it. But uh, so this is, you know, so this is a combination motion. So, and what it shows you is that translational momentum, you know, P equals MV, is independent sometimes in certain systems from angular momentum, the spin state of this guy on the motorcycle. So let's get down to some uh, brass tacks with angular momentum. And here's the, here's the interesting part. There's two kinds of angular momentum. And basically, they, they both boil down to this first one, orbital angular momentum, which is an object on some kind of a curved path about a central point of interest, you know, like a planet orbiting the sun. And then the second kind is spin angular momentum, you know, of an object that's spinning about an axis that goes right through its, uh, you know, through its own extended body. So like this disc on an axle uh, spinning at 600 RPM clockwise, that's, a, that's an example of something spinning. It's not moving anywhere. You know, if you're looking at it, you keep looking at it at the same place. You don't have to track it from left to right. From the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere, you just eyeball it. And but it's it's got angular momentum because it's spinning. And that disc, I'll, I'll just mention this. Uh, Aristotle's view of motion uh, that was not at rest, 
he always thought that something was pushing on an object from behind. For instance, an arrow. He thought that the, the air in front of the arrow rushed behind the arrow and pushed it forward. And then more air from the front of the arrow in the new position rushed behind the arrow and pushed it forward. But there's no, there's no way for that to happen here. Nobody said, Aristotle, you're a nice guy and you're a good teacher. You're pretty smart, but explain this. Explain a mill wheel. And they had mills. You know, they grinded, they ground corn and, you know, wheat and stuff to make flour and whatnot, cornmeal. Oh, uh, I don't know if they had corn, but I mean, they, ground, they, they had grains and stuff that they ground up, you know, for bread and whatnot. But you can't explain this. Aristotle could not have explained this. Or if he did, he was probably, you know, his his paragraph was about, you know, 6,000 words or something. I mean, it probably was, you know, extremely complicated explanation and bogus. So uh, those are the two kinds, orbital and spin. Now let's take a look at orbital in detail. So number four, so you want to have some point uh, of interest, a fixed point. For instance, the sun. You know, so if you have a planet going around like the Earth going around the sun, so this greenish yellowish sphere is the SUN. And there's the radius vector from the center of the sun out to the center of the Earth. And, you know, that's what we need for um, the gravitational force, uh, you know, GM1, M2 over R squared. Yeah, so that's the same R, positional R. And, uh, you know, so that's a nice circular orbit. And circular orbits are easy to work with. But you can, you know, you can also use an elliptical orbit. You know, like comets are frequently, you know, like Halley's Comets on a fairly elliptical orbit. And that's a little trickier to do. but And you need trig out the wazoo for that. But you could do it. Okay. So you need the distance um, and the angle if you're on an ellipse. Uh, from that point to the planet or comet. So from the center of the SUN out to the planet or comet or whatever it is that's on um, some kind of a gravitational trajectory. And then the other thing you need is the velocity vector, okay? And they're all related to the orbital angular momentum. You know, you need velocity because it's a momentum. So you got to have an MV in there, but it's also orbital so there's something spinning about it. So you have to at least have the radius of the circle that it's following. All right. So all that stuff factors in. Now, here's the velocity. Okay. And the orbit, uh, the orbital angular momentum formula is simply this. On a circular orbit, like this one that we've got here, the angular momentum, L, that's a common symbol for angular momentum, uh, is equal to MRV. And there's no trig in there. For those of you that have tr have had trig class, you know, you know, there's sines and cosines of theta and stuff. We don't have to do it if it's a circular orbit. All right? Now, an elliptical orbit is a little bit tougher. Okay? So you, have, you need a lot of trig for that. Let's take a look at a, an elliptical orbit. So get a, go ahead and draw something. Make it look like this if you can, roughly. So the sun is at the focus of this ellipse. And this little set of numbers over here in the lower right, those are the semi-major axis, 400, semi-minor axis, 240, the focal distance, C, 320, and the ellipticity, 0.8. And if you, you know, care to go back to your old trig book or something and look up ellipses, you can figure out what all those things mean. The semi-major axis is half the width the, along the long uh, dimension of the ellipse. Semi-minor axis is half the height along the short symmetry axis. The sun is not at the center of the, fo of the ellipse. It's at the focus. So you have to have point C or uh, uh, value C figured out, and these are and it, you know these are actually in pixels. All right, I did this real carefully. Um, so this so A is 400 pixels, 
B is 240 pixels, and so on. Now let's draw in the uh, uh, the you know position vector here. There's the comet. There's the sun. And let me identify a couple more points. Uh, here's perihelion. This is the point of closest approach of this comet to the SUN. Uh, para means above or next to. All right, and so above or next to the sun, meaning close to the sun. And then aphelion is way out here at the far end of the ellipse, all right, on the other end of the major axis. And aphelion means it's like apogee. Apogee is the point farthest from the center of the Earth for something that's orbiting the Earth. And aphelion is the farthest point from the helion. The helios, the sun, and that's from the Greek um, uh, preposition uh, apo, meaning away from. And an example of uh, a, a, another English word that uses apo is uh, apostle, somebody that's sent apo. They're sent away on a particular mission. So here's the position vector r, and check this out. There's the velocity vector v. It's tangent to the ellipse, and we'll just say that it's going around uh, clockwise. So you're going to have some kind of velocity like that, um, and as a result, the, the position vector r and the velocity vector v, they're not perpendicular. Now, on a circle, they're perpendicular because a circle, the radius is perpendicular to the velocity. All right, but on this one, it's not. So you got to do a lot of trig, and we're not going to do a lot of trig. But you can do it, and do you want to do – you want to do a lot of trig? No, you're saying that. No, no, okay. Yeah, we're not going to do a lot of trig. Uh, but circular orbits are kind of a walk in the park because you just – if you know the radius of the orbit, uh, you're good. And then the, the orbital speed – and the mass, because velocity is always perpendicular to the radius on a circular path. Um, but you know what? I want, I want to point. So let me go backwards a little bit here. Um, the, there are two. Go ahead and make a note. There are two places where the orbital angular momentum is equal to m r v. All right. And the two places are perihelion and aphelion. Now they have different R's. All right. Can you repeat them one more time? Yeah. The two places on an ellipse, you know, if you're if you're not at perihelion or aphelion, you've got to do a ton of trick. But if you're at perihelion, MRV is perfect. Because on this one, you know, your your uh, velocity. Let's say your velocity is going is taking you around clockwise at perihelion. And go ahead and sketch in the velocity vector at perihelion. It's straight downward, and therefore it's perpendicular to the radius vector at that point. And so L equals mRV. So um, L equals m times radius at per, per, perihelion times velocity at perihelion. But the other place where you can do that is out here at aphelion. And out here for this one, um, aphelion, the velocity is straight up, right, because it's going around clockwise. But it's a lot smaller velocity because it's way further away out there at aphelion. It's just kind of poking along, very slow. But it's got a big R. So the M is the same. It's just the same comet, right? But R at aphelion times V at aphelion times M equals M times R at perihelion times V at perihelion. All right. And so at those two points, you can you can use MRV. Right. There's going to be different R's, different V's, but they're equal because angular momentum on these elliptical orbits is a constant. Now, um, let's talk about spin angular momentum. All right, this is the other kind. 
and spin angular momentum is basically a, a, just a big sum of a bunch of teeny orbital angular momenta. So think of this disk rotating on an axle, 600 RPM. So, so that's, you know, 10 revolutions per second, right, 600 per minute. So it's pretty much jamming, but every pixel, but every, um, you know, every object on there is going at an angular velocity uh, of 600 RPM. Okay, so that 600, that's what we call the angular velocity, and I'll give you a little formula for that in a second. Now, electrons have intrinsic spin, same as this, uh, but we don't really understand the quantum basis for the spin of electrons or for uh, photons. Photons of light also have spin, and it's kind of mysterious. But let's get back to the spin angular momentum. Every point ha on the rotating body, same one, has the same angular velocity. So what that means is uh, angular velocity omega, that kind of curvaceous W, is a lowercase Greek omega. And it's simply the ratio of the change of angle, you know, so this could be 20 degrees per second or so many degrees per second or so many revolutions per minute, RPMs, right? So delta theta, and you can see the different thetas that they got there over delta T. So, so many degrees per second, for instance. But two points on the object, if they're at different distances from the, the axis of rotation, they're going to have different speeds, all right? So the speed, if you're in close, if you're at a small value of R here, you're going to have a fairly low speed, all right? But if you're out there at the rim of this disk, you're really bolting, you're really blazing. You have maximum speed out there, simply because you have a bigger circumference. So every point um, uh, on this disk Make, takes the same amount of time to make a full revolution. But if you're traveling a bigger circumference out at the rim of the disk in the same amount of time as something down here uh, towards the center that's going a very small circumference, you got you got you got to really whip. You got to you know to stay you know for to stay in step. So the stuff out at the edge is a big velocity. Stuff on the inside has a smaller velocity. But, you know, you can do L equals MRV for all of these things, all right? And there's a simple formula that we'll work on uh, for Thursday. All right? Now, um, so the, the way that you can think about this is every pixel of this disk has, a, has a, a, a radial distance from the axis, and it has a speed, and it has a mass. So every one gram pixel will have a mass of one gram, 0 0.001 kilogram. Oh, by the way, did you catch that convert on homework, I think, I don't know, homework six, the brain burner, the mass was given in grams, and you had to convert to kilograms. And I think I caught... I, I didn't do it to, to, to be difficult or anything, but um, I think I caught a few of you napping on that. But uh, somebody revealed the, the, the technique uh, in discussion, so that helped out at least one person. But anyways, every gram of, you know, every one gram pixel has a distance from the axis and has a speed. And the more radius you have, the more speed you have. So those things out towards the edge, Every pixel out towards the edge has got a lot of orbital angular momentum. And the thing about spin angular momentum is you have, you know, if it's a simple object like this, you can figure out a pattern um, and figure out the uh, angular momentum in terms of the spin rate omega instead of L equals MRV. But L equals MRV is the, is the, is the basic idea for spin angular momentum, at least for objects like this. Now, what are the properties of angular momentum? It's a special kind of momentum that you see when an ice skater at the Olympics spins. 
Now on Thursday, I'm going to bring some equipment in, and we're going to I'm going to try to um, show you angular momentum of a spinning student and a bicycle wheel, and it's going to be kind of cool to look at. And this will be on exam two, all right? Because Thursday is the last day of material for exam two. So we're going to have that demonstration. It's going to be kind of cool. But, if you know, the, the thing that we're going to demonstrate is what I call the ice skater effect. If you've ever watched figure skating at the Olympics or something like that, you'll see that, like, this um, ice skater has extended her leg outward, but if and she's trying to slow down. If she wanted to speed up, she would bring her body inward. She'd bring her, you know, she'd straighten up from one foot, Man, I can't even imagine. I mean, I I can skate, but I can't skate on one skate like that. That's whew, that's got to be tough. But if she wanted to spin up faster on one skate or two skates, she'd bring her arms in. And you've seen that. You know, the ice skater brings their arms in, they start spinning really fast. But then when they want to stop, they, you know, when they finish their routine and they stop spinning, they go like this. Ta-da! You know, but it's not, they're not trying to go ta-da like that. They're trying to put their arms out so they stop spinning, right? And then they jazz it up to make it look like, yes, I'm so great, you know, ta-da. But, but really, they're just trying to, you know, manage their speed and, and not break their ankle or anything like that. Now, think of a bicycle wheel spinning on its axle. Now, this one's fixed. You know, a bicycle has a, a certain radius, you know, it's got spokes and whatnot, and it's, you know, and it rotates around its axle in the center. Each centimeter of the tire, you know, so you can think of each centimeter of the tire as like a pixel of mass. It'll be more than a gram, but I mean, you can think of it as a pixel of mass out there at that radius. All right. So it has grams of mass. It has some speed and therefore it has momentum. And since it's spinning, you can, um, and it's oriented to the axle, um, you can compute the angular momentum. Even though, the, you know, the wheel's not, and we're going to use a bicycle wheel uh, on, uh, on Thursday. Uh, even though the bicycle wheel is not, you know, might not be moving from point, you know, so like if you're in your garage and you're, you're working on your bike, you turn it over onto the handlebars and seat, and, you, you know, you mess around with the gears and stuff. And you get your tire spinning. They'll just keep spinning, you know, even though they're not going anywhere. When you're on a road surface, of course, you are going somewhere. And the reason for the ice skater effect is that angular momentum, as I've mentioned before, is a conserved quantity. It's a conserved quantity for the ice skater or pretty close to conserved quantity. You know, the, the ice skates do have a little bit of friction. The whole thing about ice skates is, low friction surface, but really sharp edges so that you can cut corners and stuff on the, on the ice and uh, get some gription uh, from the edges. But it's conserved quantity. Gravitationally, it's conserved. Uh, electromagnetically, the, the angular momentum states of an electron orbiting a proton in a hydrogen atom is also conserved. It's, it's important for quantum mechanics. So the ice skater will keep spinning. And, you know, even planets orbiting other stars um, will keep spinning around their star. And, we, you know, we, st we have studied those. We have studied many, many exoplanets now. You know, 20 years ago, we only had a handful of exoplanets that we could see orbiting another star, you know, by, by some measurement. But now we have, uh, we've, we've got this uh, spacecraft I think it's now defunct. It's called Kepler. And Kepler uh, was designed to find exoplanets around nearby stars, and it found tons of them. And here's one. It's called the TRAPPIST-1 system. And this is kind of an artist's conception. It shows you the star on the left. And here's, if you want to look this up, it's in uh, the journal Nature, 22 February, February 2017 an article by Alexander Witz. But uh, here it is, artist's conception. So they don't really know what the surfaces look like. So that's the artist. And they're, they're at different distances, and they're not even, and they're not quite this close to the star. 
but they've got this kind of so you can see they, they've got seven different uh, planets that they've identified and it's kind of an orangey reddish orange star so it's a little bit smaller than our sun it's not quite as hot uh, and what we do is we look at the light from this star and this is from another um, article this is from uh, February 23rd 2017 and uh, uh, so you can look that up uh, Michael Gillen et al um, and this is their published data and these things up here these are called light curves and basically all they do is you know they gather the light how bright is it so most of the time the star's brightness is up here but occasionally it has little dips you know, these little blobs down here are dips, and that's that's how we see a planet. When a planet goes in front of a star, its light dips a little bit, you know. And here's what the dips down here on the last uh, row on the left, these are what the dips all look like when you kind of stretch them out in time. So here's, uh, I don't know, uh, what is this, Trappist B? Trappist 1B, was that? I can't really read it. Yeah. 1B, and then so here's 1B at the top, and then here's one. Is this H down here? Yeah. So here's Trappist 1H, and you can see that they have different. The width of their dip is a little bit shorter up here because he's closer in. He's really moving. He's on a close orbit. That's how we figure it out. And this guy out here, he's kind of moseying along. He's on a little bit further out orbit. And here are the orbits. Down here. There they are. We know where they, how far the orbits are from this star. And so, and guess what? Angular momentum is conserved in a system like this. Unless, you know, some, you know, like some asteroid from another star system comes and plows into one of these planets or something. But other than that, if, if there's no outside interference, they're just going to keep circling that star nice and easy, just like that. Nice circular orbits. And we found, you know, I don't know, hundreds of these exoplanets now. In fact, some of the um, scientists, some of the physicists in our department um, are active exoplanet uh, scientists trying to figure out now, what the heck's happening with these babies? So, so angular momentum is this mysterious quantity that in gravitational systems like this is a conserved quantity. So these guys will have the same orbital period till the cows come home. And if you don't have any cows, that's a long time, my friend, until the star goes out. You know, that star will eventually go out, and then maybe those those planets will get sucked in or something. but until that time, they're just going to keep humming. Nice as you can, as you can imagine. Now, um, oh my goodness. Oh my gracious. What's today, Tuesday? Yeah. All right. Uh, so Thursday, we're going to do some angular momentum demonstrations and i've got a bunch you can look at on our youtube area uh, so go into there and uh, go in and look at angular uh, momentum uh, demonstrations you'll see a bunch of them you'll see a bunch of other stuff too but definitely take a look at those for your homework tonight all right anybody want to dismiss early today all right Let's dismiss early homework. I I, have, I thought I had a ton of information for you, but we went through it pretty fast. That's good. Homework nine will be up this afternoon. It's due on Thursday. Uh, you're dismissed. If you want your Scantron printout and didn't get it last week, you can sure come up and get it now.